Shabbat Shalom, everybody. Uh, Rabbi Stephen here, although I still prefer the name Shmuel. I just kind of like it a little bit better. Um, so this week's portion, Shoftim, and it means judgments. And full disclosure, there's a lot going on in this particular portion. So I've got kind of a chumash here as kind of a cheat sheet in case I get a little, a little lost along the way. But um, first, I would like to offer a uh, condolences to the Kaplan family. Ira and Yolanda uh, lost her mom, uh, Ella, wonderful woman, wonderful woman. Uh, her grandchildren, Yana and, and Aaron, and she had a great grandson. Uh, she and her husband, Vladimir, and, and they lost uh, Vladimir, the father, earlier in the year. And it really is kind of a, a tragedy. And when something like this happens in Judaism, we, we look back on, on the wonderful things that these people did. And when you look at the family, you see what a wonderful thing that they did. What was really remarkable about these folks too is um, they came from Russia. And I remember back in 1969, uh, my rabbi took me to New York City where we joined a million other Jews. And we basically went in front of the Soviet embassy and like our ancestors, we said, let our people go. You don't want them to practice their religion, so let them come to freedom so they can. And as a result, a lot of Jews from the Soviet Union, the then Soviet Union, were able to emigrate. So uh, the loss of a wonderful woman, I, I had the honor of meeting her, and um, she will be missed. So let's get back to this week's portion, Shoftim. Shoftim means judges. And uh, one of the Chumashim, the uh, Chabad, the ultra-Orthodox Chumash, talks about the difference between Shoftim and Shotrim, judges and police officers. And there's going to be another distinction that we're going to talk about too. But you, the, the concept there is that you've got judgment and you've got those that enforce the judgment. And the enforcement is kind of important in a society to keep the order. And in fact, the portion, even though it jumps around a bit, it really kind of talks about keeping our people on track. This is very important, especially in light of all the rebellions in the desert, the golden calf, and you know, people whining about the meat, and you know, you had a couple of rebellions, uh, Korach and Dathan, uh, an, and of course then you had uh, a foreign wizard, a sorcerer, Balaam come in and try to corrupt. The Israelites as well, so so you, we need to stay on track, and that's why we have the Chumash, that's why we have Torah. So we have that. It also talks a little bit about not worshiping false gods, and it specifically talks about the sun, the moon, and the stars, and we're going to come to that in a couple of minutes. It talks about um, having a king and what the king needs to do, and basically in Judaism, the king is a servant. The name of the king in Hebrew is Melech. Melech is, the, is, is king in Hebrew. Well, uh, that's an interesting word, uh, Melech. And we think of it as ruling. And, you know, when we talk about Hashem, we talk about Melech HaOlam, king of the world, right? But the word Melech, when you think of the word for uh, an angel, is Malach, it, it has kind of the same meaning. It's a servant. It's a messenger. And the king is the messenger of Torah, of the laws. So one of the things that the king had to do is either for him write for himself or have written his own personal copy of Torah on the parchment so that he knows what the laws are and they're there and, and, and they're there for him all the time. It talks about the priests and the Levites, the priests that minister to the, to the temple and the Levites that minister to the priests and the Levites that are in the surrounding areas. It talks about the cities of refuge when somebody accidentally kills somebody. Uh, back then, there was this whole idea of avenging the blood and the avenger of the blood. Uh, a relative of the family would go out and seek vengeance or justice, more like vengeance, on the person that caused the death. So the city of refuge was set up so that this person would be safe. It talks about uh, the people going to war. Now, when we go to war, it's a lot different than when a lot of other societies and a lot of other cultures go to war because war is fought in the most humanely way possible. Now, that's a contradiction of terms, of course, because war in and of itself, by definition, is not a humane thing. But what the Israelites have to do first is approach the people and ask them to surrender. And if they surrender 
and I know this sounds a little barbaric, especially for our times, the people are taken in as slaves and, and, and mandatory servants. But they are always given that option to surrender. And when they do, and if they don't, we wage war. One of the things we don't do is we don't cut down trees. Right? Trees didn't do anything to you, so we leave them alone. Plus the fact that what do trees do? They give us food. They give us shelter. Right? So, so they're a natural resource, and we kind of leave them alone. Uh, finally, and this is another interesting thing, when the generals are in front of the troops for war, one of the things that they ask the people is a series of questions. They ask the men, okay, who just recently got married, who just recently built a house after getting married, who just recently planted a vineyard or, a, or, a, or, or, or crops and hasn't had the opportunity to reap the benefits, right? Those are the people that are sent home right away, right? They, we, don't, we don't let them go out and risk their life without having enjoyed the fruits of that. But then there's something else that they ask that's very interesting. They say, who is going to be faint of heart? Who doesn't want to do this? Now, there's two things that happen here. First of all, you don't want people that are afraid in the front lines trying to wage war, ultimately cowering, and then causing a distraction to the men that are actually going out and trying to win the war. So you don't want people who are faint-hearted in the lines because they're going to cause a problem. But think about it. Let's say you have somebody who is quote unquote faint hearted and doesn't want to fight. And there they are in front of everybody and the priests. And, the, and there was a priest, by the way, there was a battle priest. In fact, Pinchas, who was Aaron's grandson, was actually the first battle priest. But the priest, the generals, they ask that question, who is faint hearted, doesn't want to go to war. You're looking, people are looking around and you really think they're going to cop to being afraid. All of a sudden they may get this burst of courage seeing that all their friends are there, you know, and they don't want to, you know, turn around and go home. You know, it's kind of like a little bit of a peer pressure. Okay. So those are actually the main points of, uh, in synopsis of that particular portion. But let's go back. All right. We talked about the word shoftim, which is judgments. In the third verse of this particular portion, uh, this is, I believe, chapter 17, verse 20. It says, Tzedek, Tzedek, Tirdaf. Justice, justice shall you perform. It's interesting that there are two words for justice, right? We have Shoftim, which are judgments, which are physically laws judgments. And I think in one of the Chumashim I was reading, they kind of turn it around a little bit. Because Shoftim and Tzedek, Tzedakah, both mean judge, judgment. But one of them is judgment, like here's the law, this is what you do, as opposed to hukim, which is a decree like kashru. You know, why do we remain kashru? Who knows? You know, all we have to know is that God told us to be kashru, that there are some animals you eat, some animals you don't. You don't cook a kid in its mother's milk, which means if you're going to eat a meal, you have dairy, then you have meat, and then you wait a while until you have dairy again. Right? Why? Who knows? Doesn't matter. Hashem ordained it, that's what we do, that's a decree. A judgment is more like, okay, be honest in your dealings in business. That's a judgment, right? Because it's concrete. You can understand that. You want to create trust. You don't want to cheat somebody. It's not fair to take advantage of somebody who maybe not know business the way you do, right? But where does tzedakah come into that? Well, tzedakah is kind of a heavenly type of a judgment. Okay, so um, in our service uh, last week, the week before, one of the congregants, Bob Kaplan, shout out to you, Bob, you said, where does this idea of tikkun olam, repairing the world, come from? Well, tzedek, tzedek, terdof. There it is. You know, justice, justice shall you pursue. And think about why the word tzedek, tzedakah, means justice and charity. We can think that Hashem put us here to do his job for, to help him with his job, which is to make sure that people are, are, are healthy and well-fed and have shelter, taking care of the stranger among you, because we were strangers in Egypt, taking care of the widow and the orphan, making sure that if somebody happens to be enslaved, they're taken care of, they're not mistreated, all right? So we're doing, God, that's how we're doing God's work, and there's the command, all right? So that's interesting. So you've got the physical judgments, what you should do, and then there's kind of like the interpretation. Well, even though it doesn't say that, you still got to act morally. Now let's look at something else. Let's talk about worshiping other gods. Now in the Ma'ariv service, the evening service, we say Ma'ariv Aravim, that's that, that particular blessing, the first of the two blessings prior to the Shema. It says, you know, God who, who formed the heavens and set the, the heavenly bodies, the sun, the moon, they, they follow their path according to his divine will. That's what we say, okay? So we understand 
that those heavenly bodies are God's creation. They follow according to his will. They don't cause anything. They don't, they're not gods. We don't worship them, okay? Which means astrology, sorry, it's out. Now, yes, there's a, a astrology in, in, in Judaism. We have an, an astrology, a type of astrology, but we understand that it's still God's will. So, as a lot of you remember, this past week we saw an eclipse and people were talking about it. It's a time of new and, you know, and of course it was the new month and, and you know, we got the spiritual energy. Oh, well, maybe. You know, we Jews, we don't look at it that way. We say it's all according to Hashem. And in fact, we just, we are we celebrated the new month of Elul. And when we observe the new month, it's kind of like a mini new year. It's a new beginning. So we have 11 of those throughout the course of the year. And of course, the 12th one is really the Rosh Hashanah. It's the head of the year, not just the head of the month. It's the head of the year, the Rosh head. So, so I hope you enjoyed that. We're going to cut it off right now. We're at 11 minutes. And uh, Shabbat Shalom. Hope you've had a great week. And... Hope to see you in services. Thank you.